Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jane Park, and I am the Fire Vegetation Specialist for the BAP Field Unit in BAP National Park in Canada. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, kind of the, the interface and the landscape between wildfire, the types of wildfires that uh, both Ed and Sophie chatted about, and kind of how um, the human picture in terms of communities and landscape management uh, fits into that picture. Um, I wanted to start um, first by acknowledging that uh, Banff National Park, where I'm located, is within the present day territories of the Treaty 6, 7, 8 um, peoples, as well as the Métis homelands, and to acknowledge that the lands and waters of Banff National Park have been used by millennia by, uh, for millennia by Indigenous peoples for sustenance, ceremony, trade, and travel. Um, including fire management, and we thank them for their continuous stewardship and sharing the land with us here. Um, so as I go through my slides, uh, some of these things will be familiar from both uh, Ed and Sophie's um, presentations, but I'll give you some local context. Um, Bath National Park is located in Alberta and the Canadian Rockies. Um, we were the first national park in Canada to be established in 1885. It's just where the yellow star is there. And this is where I am. So I'm in the Banff town site. Um, that, this is a view from the 1920s. And so you can see in this photo that um, the landscape is really heterogeneous. It's got a lot of open meadowlands. There are open Douglas fir and aspen grasslands. Um, for those of you familiar with the area, the mountain you see there in the background is Mount Norquay. There's a ski area there now where people ski. Um, and I'll just transition that to a more recent photo from 1984. And now you can see that that ski area is uh, fully treed. It's a homogenous stand of coniferous trees. And the only things that are, that are open are the ski areas. And you can see now how development of the, um, of the town has kind of been embedded in that uh, um, kind of matrix of dense forest. And this is kind of like the conundrum and the challenge that a lot of land managers face, both in Canada and the U.S., where fire is part of the ecosystem. We live in fire-prone environments, but we've now um, injected communities into these landscapes, and we've done a really good job of putting fires out over time. So if you look at what's happened in Banff specifically, this is the area burned by wildfire over time up until the late 60s. And it mirrors what Ed said about, you know, big fires in the early 1900s in this area. A lot of them either started by lightning or the railway coming through. And then you can see that over time, we've had many years with absolutely no fire. And that is atypical for the fire regime or the fire history of this area. Um, fire history studies have showed that within Banff, um, it's typical for about 2,800 hectares to burn on an annual basis throughout this, this area. Um, so we got really good at putting fires out and fires basically were eliminated from our landscape and the ecosystem resulting in these really dense, thick, coniferous and flammable forests. Right in the middle, that's where the town is. We have a permanent population somewhere around 8,000, maybe slightly less during COVID. We have annual visitation here of over 4 million people, mostly in July and August, pre-COVID. <laughs> um, and the tourism industry impacts are a huge concern. That's the, a large input to the Alberta economy, to the Canadian economy. Um, most people visit the town of Banff. Um, largely, they, uh, many people don't even leave the town of Banff. It's, so there is a disconnect sometimes with the ecosystem and the processes that go on in the park. We also have the Trans-Canada Highway, which is the main transportation corridor for um, transport across Canada. Um, shutting the Trans-Canada down um, affects the Canadian economy um, heavily, uh, even with a short closure. Uh, we have scenic routes and we also have the CP Railway that goes through. So it's quite a complex landscape, um, even though we are fire prone to uh, manage. You couple that with climate change, as Ed indicated, um, in our area, this figure here shows how much um, our fire seasons will increase over time um, in the next kind of uh, 70, 70, 50 to 70 years. And, you know, in some places of, of the park, we will experience up to 60 additional days um, of fire season. So we'll have longer fire seasons. Most of the research shows that they will be drier, uh, more, more severe. So how do we um, look at this landscape and make sure that both kind of socially and economically 
um, but also at the ecosystem level, we're more resilient to land. Um, so in Parks Canada, um, we recognize that fire is a, a critical process on the in the environment. And there are kind of three things that I'll touch on for my presentation, which are that we want to promote landscape resilience to wildfire and climate change through prescribed fire, managed wildfire, and fuel management. The first, the first piece of the puzzle, everybody's uh, familiar with fire suppression. Um, so, you know, we, if you just focus on this map here, in Parks Canada, we've zoned the park in terms of, you know, red, yellow, and green. In the red zone, that's where our infrastructure is. So in those areas, you know, it's, it's incompatible to have um, out of control wildfires overlapping with our communities, our critical infrastructure. So it's full suppression. But in as many places we can in the park, we want fire to play its natural role. So in the yellow zone, which is just a little bit further into the back country where there are, you know, some, some values at risk, maybe not all, not as many in the front country. Um, we try to allow fires to play their natural role, but we still try to limit their spread, you know, to make sure that um, the public is still safe and, and we're meeting our ecological objectives. And then further in the back country, as much as possible, we allow fire to play its natural role as a disturbance agent on the landscape to renew the ecosystem. And we do try to do prescribed fires in all zones. So this is just an example of uh, managed fire and wildfire. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, the Verdant Creek wildfire 2017. That was a, uh, sorry, a lightning start fire. Um, it, it experienced full suppression. Um, it escaped initial attack and it burned throughout the season. Um, and then on the right hand side, this is actually from uh, two days ago, <laughs> we were conducting some prescribed fire in the back country. And you can see they do look fairly similar. Um, they, wildfires can occur in all seasons. They generally though in this area and many places in Western Canada, um, they are of high severity, high intensity. They're long in duration. They have many smoke impacts that can affect public health. Um, and they're fairly difficult to mitigate because they often start during drought conditions. As opposed to prescribed fires, we can uh, write prescriptions. They can occur in all seasons. Um, and generally, they're of mixed intensity and severity. We're usually aiming for specific ecological impacts. Um, we can shorten their dura duration by looking at weather patterns and trying to ensure that we have precipitation coming in the forecast. And so the smoke impacts can be lessened. Um, they're variable in size because we can either create containment lines or use natural features for their to, to be barriers. And we can target um, atmospheric conditions that are uh, that promote venting of smoke away from communities. So if you lengthen the time frame of that original graph, you can see here, I'll just take my up there. You can see here all the way up to this year. Um, you can see where Parks Canada started our first prescribed fire, which is in the 1980s, 1983, and that how much fire we've restored to the landscape. And we're, we have a target in the mountain national parks of 50% of the historic fire cycle. And what this does is promote landscape resilience. There's more heterogeneity. That big blanket of coniferous forests um, is broken up on the landscape. And so we can uh, ensure that uh, future wildfires kind of are broken up into smaller pieces, but it takes a lot of planning. And so this map here of all the red and green, the red shows fires, um, shows uh, all of the old forests, the old coniferous forests in the park. You can see there are no shortage. And the green is actually all of our planned prescribed fires in the next 10 years. That doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna burn all of that area, it just, Given that we have to wait for the right weather conditions and that, that sort of thing, we have to do lots of planning in order to get um, even aim for 50% of the historic fire cycle. So we actually have over 66,000 hectares of prescribed pl fire planned for the next 10 years, even though we're only targeting 14,000 hectares. And so a lot of work goes into these prescribed fires at the landscape level. This map is busy, but that's on purpose. So it shows all of the complete prescribed fires in the kind of darker shades of black, the proposed prescribed fires in orange, completed fuel management. So in the areas where we can't conduct fire, we do, uh, we do, do mechanical logging within the park. And that's so that we can facilitate these landscape level prescribed fires and also to protect the communities that are embedded within our parks. 
The yellow are, are proposed management, uh, fuel management areas. And so hopefully by doing this, we can make uh, places like the town of Banff that are surrounded by a fire prone environment, more resilient to climate change and fires in, in the future. This photo here is a 300 hectare mechanical um, fire guard that's just on the outside of the, just on the edge of the park to the east. The town of Canmore would be um, just out of the picture to the bottom. And then you can actually see the red tinge just beyond the logged block is actually a prescribed fire that was conducted in 2003. And this other picture that uh, popped up is the West Sulphur Fire Guard. And that was just logged two years ago and with another 147 hectares planned for this fall. Um, and that will protect the town of Banff from any fires approaching from the west, which is our predominant uh, wind direction. So that's at the landscape level scale. So it's at the big landscape level scale. It's at the mes meso level scale adjacent to town. And then there's a role for the public and homeowners to play um, with programs such as Fire Smart Canada, um, where homeowners and landowners can treat the fuels and look at what their building materials of their homes are. Um, we also work within the, or on the outskirts of town with our crews in the wintertime um, to Fire Smart uh, any facilities on the boundary between the town and, and the park. And so all these things combined can kind of make um, our communities and the landscape uh, a more resilient place. But the one thing we do need to keep in mind is obvious that public support and understanding of how fire works on the eco in the ecosystem um, and support for a prescribed fire program is paramount. If we don't have public support or the public doesn't understand what we're trying to do, it's very difficult for us to do this type of high risk kind of land management um, strategy. And so we do a lot of public outreach. We do a lot of emergency response training with the town of Banff. Um, we, we communicate a lot with the public so they understand what we're doing and how it'll help in the future. So I just want to leave uh, my talk with just a message of how, you know, uh, landscape heterogeneity and, and mitigating risk at multiple scales um, can result in more resilient forests and communities. And to understand that when it's too complex for fire, there needs to be other tools that we use to modify the fuel to facilitate landscape fire management. Um, we can use other bits of science like fire behavior modeling to prioritize our implementation of these these tools, and we need to work collaboratively with um, our partners, municipal governments, academia to achieve these objectives. And we really need to spend a lot of time with careful planning and strong public support and engagement um, is paramount to the whole program. So that's all I've got for today, and I'll pass it on to Ed or Stephanie.